I'll introduce it. Uh, you know, this last year, last night we had a, a silent moment for folks we've lost in the past year, DXers, et cetera. And uh, one of the folks, we don't normally do this, but one of the folks, and I'm hoping some of the contesters made it here. I made this the last presentation for our, our session so that some of the contesters could be here and hear it as well. But uh, Paul W0AIH uh, unfortunately fell off his tower this last year. And I was looking for somebody who could uh, do a little tribute for uh, what Paul has done, et cetera, in the DX and the uh, contesting arena. So I finally got Glenn to agree. I had, I, you know, I had to dig deep to have somebody who was willing to talk. It's unusual. But uh, Glenn's agreed to do a, do a small tribute to us on, uh, on uh, Paul. And he's titled his, I have to get these things out to remember them, uh, W, the legacy of W0AIH, what can we carry forward? Well, I think that's a good, uh, good way to look at it. Glenn, thank you very much. Any questions again before uh, we turn it over to Glenn? All right, here we go. Glenn, W0GJ. Thank you. How many have worked W0AIH? I mean, who hasn't worked W0AIH? How many have been to the farm? How many could keep up with Paul at the farm? No one. Well, Paul uh, was born on Christmas Day, 1933, and uh, died last fall in a tower accident. And we're going to talk about that dash in between those two dates. He was born Christmas Day in Nebraska. His father was a Lutheran pastor, and Paul was eventually too. He was licensed at the age of 15. That sounds familiar to a lot of us. Graduated from high school in 1952, and Dick Airhorn was one of his classmates. And he graduated from Concordia Seminary in 1958. And one time I was working with him, and on the crane it said 1949. And he said, that's the year I was licensed. And I said, that's the year I was born. And he said, I've been a ham your whole life. You got to understand Paul, how he emphasizes things. Here's a picture of him when he was 15. Here's a picture of him in Concordia College. And he was able to get, talk to administration to put in a beam on top of the administration building. He had a lot of degrees. He had a Bachelor of Divinity degree, but he also had a BS degree. He was the best scavenger. I don't think he spent a dime on a tower. Everything he put up that, for example, a lot of his towers came from his church. The church would bid, the church, Paul, would bid on tower demolition, and the church would get the money, and he would get the towers, a win-win situation. So he made a lot of things. He had a degree in EE. He was probably the most enthusiastic Elmer you can imagine. He also had an MS degree. He had many signs and license plates, a sense of humor. And he also had a PhD degree, the priorities that he defended, his faith, family, missions, and actually his radio hobby was at the bottom of the list, if you can believe it. Many years ago, um, he and Mary acquired this farm, about 130 acres from a, um, a parishioner that died. There was no electricity and no running water on this farm. And shortly after Paul and Mary got it, the first thing that went up was a 164 square and a tall tower, again, without electricity or running water. And antennas grew. It really was an antenna farm. It grew and grew more antennas. And from the top of this tower, you can even see the curvature of the earth. Well, maybe this was a drone or an airplane shot, but that's what it looks like. When you drive by on the interstate, this is what you see. And uh, you'd always ask Paul how many towers he had. I don't know. I just want to put up six more this year. And, you know, one time I was there a few years ago, and I actually lost count somewhere around 70. And whenever he'd go someplace, he would climb your tower and take a picture. And he made the cover of CQ magazine once, twice. Nobody makes it more than twice on the cover of CQ magazine. There's the third time Paul made the cover of CQ magazine. This is building a tick, the world's largest tick ring from a silage unloader, and it eventually turned a 40-meter beam. 
And like I said, he made everything. He did a lot of welding. He made his own rings for his rotating towers. Uh, he made his own rotors, big heavy things. He was uh, really quite a mechanic. He had so many antennas, nobody made antenna switches, so he made his own out of coffee cans. So this is what his antenna switches looked like. And he had an unlimited supply of aluminum and tower and antennas, and in the shop he could make about anything. And there was no antenna project or tower project he didn't have hardware to help you with. He had quite an assortment. And every place he went, he took his AIH buckets and his big come-alongs. That's what I remember. And if you'd go to a tower project, he would bring everything with him, more than you could ever use. And his gin pole would give most hams tower envy. And of course, he wouldn't make things better. It always had to be bigger. This is Paul's idea of a gin pole. His favorite gin pole was a 40-foot section of Roan 25. And he could handle this himself. I helped him with it a few times. But he liked to ride the rope. Once he got it up there, he liked to ride the rope. And unfortunately, that's what was his demise. Instead of climbing and being connected to the tower, he was always riding the rope. And um, that fateful day, the, the, the rope that held the pulley at the top of the tower failed. And that's what, uh, what happened to Paul. And this is his truck. Big gulp. He had a name for everything. And this is Mary, his wife. And uh, Mary always winched him up and winched him down, so they must have had a very good relationship. And he always lovingly referred to her as his winch winch. <laughs> this is uh, inside the contest station showing uh, for a multi multi only five positions because the 20 meter shack was all by itself. And those are the control cables and coax cables for just 20 meters. Always big. Everything was big. This is Paul working the uh, Wisconsin QSO party last year, and he got first place. Can you imagine that? So he was really proud of that. This project, the 80-meter beam, three-element 80-meter beam, he worked on for several years, and the boom was 120 feet of pie rod. Pie rod now is solid steel. So that's, I don't know what the, boom, what the beam weighed, but that was the three element beam. There it goes up by a big crane, and he designed it so you could go out and work on it. And you can see the little thing you could strap onto and go out. You, <clears throat> a Paul, maybe not me or you, but Paul would go out there and work and tune the, tune the elements as needed. And I can tell you this three element beam is probably going to be up longer than any three element 80 meter beam in history. But his favorite antennas were rhombics. He loved his rhombic antennas. And uh, several years ago, um, he put up a wind generator. He was very proud of this. He, he was very proud of the fact that he never paid an electric bill after this thing turned on. He said it powered, every, he said it powered everything in his station except his key. And I said, we'll see about that. So I made this for Paul. <laughs> and he loved it. I don't think he had DXCC license plates, but he had worked all continents many times over. You can see Zorro's license plate there at the bottom. There's Africa, South America. There's even Bhutan on there. So. Lots of license plates, lots of signs, even more license plates. And he loved Burma shave signs. How many remember Burma shave signs? Well, he had one going up his driveway once. Don't take a curve at 60 per. Would hate to lose a contester. Burma shave. He went to WRTC last year um, for WRTC and also to see his fifth daughter, Sandy, who's here today. Stand up, Sandy. And he really enjoyed WRTC. But, you know, he always would climb a tower and take a picture. But the security guards at each of the stations wouldn't let him climb a tower. So he had to climb something. So he climbed a stile and took a picture from the stile. And, you know, Paul was a Lutheran minister. And five, over 500 years ago, Martin Luther uh, put his 95 theses on the wall of the Wittenberg Chapel or Cathedral. But Paul had one more. 
everyone should honor the organist and all who play music in any church. Music is a great addition to church worship. So that was Paul's 96th thesis. He also uh, got to know Gennady, UN7QF, uh, over the radio. And uh, to make a long story short, Gennady came to the U.S., went to seminary, and started uh, many churches in uh, the former Soviet Union. And Paul would go over and he would operate from there. And he married many hams, and last year was his last wedding with Jerry and Val. And uh, he was quite a DXer. This is the DX forum. And uh, he had, uh, according to ARL, 390 countries confirmed. Who has the most? Does anybody know what the most countries that anybody has ever confirmed, whether they're alive or silent key? 393. Well, just before he died, Paul was working on another submission. There are 402 entities possible, and he had 10 that he was working on to submit. He had, car he had found cards for five or six of these and uh, hadn't quite found the others yet, but, you know, he might have a record. Ten years ago, he was inducted into the CQ Contest Hall of Fame, and Paul and Mary were married 65 years. This is one of my favorite pictures of Paul. <clears throat> it was taken a couple of days before he died, and, you know, at age 86, you know, 180 feet, this has got to be priceless. He didn't mince words. No one could keep up with him. He retired as a pastor at the year in 2000, but worked as a renter of for another 17 years. And he knew his destiny, and he designed his own gravestone. <clears throat> he wanted an obelisk that looked like a tower, and he'd even prepared his own funeral service. There's his gravestone. There's an epitaph on it. About 12 years ago, Paul and I were traveling to Dayton, and we were laughing about funny epitaphs that were on tombstones. And uh, he said, I want to be buried with my Bible, my hymnal, and my original key. <clears throat> and he recited Isaiah 53 many times that predicts the coming of the Messiah. And he sang, he would just sing long songs from memory. And after we got back from Dayton, I said, he called me and said, that's it. I'm putting that on my tombstone. That's my epitaph. I said, but Paul, it's too long. He said, that's what I'm going to put on my tombstone. And this is what he put on it. A Bible, a hymnal, and a key, a passion for these three. The key is now silent, but Paul King's with the Savior of Isaiah 53. Twenty eighteen, sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. Anyway, that dash is our life. That's what everybody's going to remember. And time can be our enemy and it can be our friend. What will you leave behind? What's you know, it's not too late to change course. You can use your resourcefulness, your enthusiasm, your humor and priorities. And what priorities will you defend? Paul really liked the ARRL, and he was a Maximum Society member. And when he got his Maxim cards, he sent this to me. You can donate to it with GoFundMe the ARL Foundation, you can just Google the W0AIH Scholarship Fund and you'll
humor, but most important, he defended and was not ashamed of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. After the few So if you want to look at more about Paul, you can uh, go to QTH.com or just Google W0AIH. And again, here's his uh, epitaph. Any questions about Paul that I might be able to answer? Yes? I think I'm, I'm done. Leave that up. Leave, no, put, put that back up. I'll enjoy that if you can enjoy something like that, but it's nice to know that some of us do have something around our dash, if you will. At least somebody will have the same kind of feelings about us. Okay, we have one more shot for you folks. Before we rotate them and put it on the bottom, but five tickets for 20 bucks of five bucks each. And I hope somebody.